got our when was the last time bitcoins and blockchains right mm -hmm. uh, now we are meeting now uh, sometimes during my talk today uh, there might be some sounds like ah ooh coming in <laughs> I had a surgery last week and I'm just recovering and it is not uh, good to say apology to uh, 80, 90 people telling that, you know, uh, we have to reschedule because of the surgery. So I thought that I should go ahead. Uh, and the topic is also very interesting. And I believe that once we get into the details, my pain and everything will go. Uh, <laughs> right? And uh, today we are going to talk about Hadoop 3 and uh, Spark 2. Both technologies we have introduced some time back. Uh, it's very exciting to know because, as you know, I have seen a poem uh, during some WhatsApp exchange telling that 10 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound, WWW was a stuck keyboard, cloud was in the sky, 4G was a parking space, Google was a baby's birth, and Skype was a typo. And today, if you look at all these things, you will see a completely different connotation. And you will see that, you know, all these are transformed into some very important things in our daily life. And if you look at the Google and do a search on one of the R algorithms, one of the best visualizations ever created in R, you will see this graph which is created at Facebook and all the lines and the density that you are seeing are the number of people who are currently communicating at the time of generating the graph, communicating across the globe through the Facebook network. So look at the beauty of analytics that is created out of data, right? And if you look at the latest news, you can see that now Pentagon is afraid of drones and they are finding out ways how they can prevent the drones from, you know, making something wrong. And then you will see that virtual reality is coming a big, big, big hit. You can see that API development is going on across all sectors. You can see that chatbots are going to take the horizon very soon. If you are not aware of chatbots, today you have seen banks, insurance companies, etc. are creating chatbots in such a way that there is no manual intervention at all and you just give your you know, ID or the details, it will automatically go find out the data related to you and then it will come back and tell you that Yes, you are eligible for a particular loan or you are eligible for a credit card. Chatbots are now getting developed on the top of APIs. So, so many things, so many transformations and actions are happening in the technology world. And let's also try to incorporate one of those technologies, which is going to play a very significant role in the coming months and coming years. Hadoop 3 and Spark 2. And that's what the topic of this particular day. This is a summary. No need to look at the summary. Why? Because we are going to see all these details one by one. But if you want to get a bird's eye view of what's there in Hadoop 3 and what I'm going to discuss today is these 12 items. Out of that, some I will concentrate more time some are very simple, not much significant. We don't have to spend time. And then we will try to see what we can accommodate uh, with respect to Spark 2. And finally, I will tell you some architecture uh, practices that you can use for combining Hadoop 3 and Spark 2. And that's a brief summary of what I'm going to do today. And make sure that you are listening to all my word count programs because by the end of this particular session, you should all be calling yourself as Dr. Word Count. You will get doctorate from Jack's Big Data in Word Count <laughs> because you are going to see some 20 to 25 different ways of writing Word Count today. And now, let us start. First and most important thing is that you need a minimum of Java version 8 for running Hadoop 3. Hadoop 2 
was backward compatible, you can run Hadoop 2 in Java 7, Java 7 or Java 6, but for Hadoop 8, the minimum version that you need is Java 8. Why? There is a significant architectural change, the way in which the code has been developed. Because out of all the features so far, one of the best releases that Oracle has done, combined with the Sun Microsystems earlier, is Java 8. And Java 8 brings you Nash Horn, one of the beautiful facilities where you can combine JavaScript along with Java. Earlier versions of Java were combining with something called Rhino, Mozilla's JavaScript language, and they changed that and they added highly 10 times better performing Nash Horn JavaScript framework into Java 8. They have got Lambda expressions. They are moving towards functional programming, maybe inspired by Scala. We will talk about Scala a little bit later. And Java 8 brings Lambda expressions. There are some beautiful classes in Java 8 which is allowing you to write stream-based applications. With all these features, writing parallelism became much easier in Java 8. For example, if you are familiar with the swing programming in Java, if you want to create a UI in which you have got a button and you want to press the button and you want to perform some action, you want to print, you click to me, this is the style that you write from Java 2, Java 3, AWT, abstract window toolkit days onwards. But in Java 8, this is how you are going to write exactly that particular function. And as you can see, there is an arrow coming here. And you can see that there is no parameter. Why? Because Java 8 automatically identifies that action listener has got only one method called action performed, which can take only action event as a parameter. And automatically, it will call that particular function. See the composability and the beauty in writing that particular function in a completely different way from what you earlier practiced. This type of lambda functions are a lot being used in the re-architecture of Hadoop 3. That's why it is not backward compatible. If you use lambda expressions in a language using Java 8, you know very well that it cannot be backward compatible with a version which does not support uh, lambda expressions and Java 7 does not have this lambda expressions in place. So, since you know that there is this Java 8, we can immediately jump into one beautiful facility and I'm going to show you first before going to anything else how you can write Java 8 word count. So, our doctorate study is starting now. So, we are going to have Java 8 and on Java 8 we are going to have word count and let me explain you first three ways of writing word count. One, I am going to use Java streams in Java 8. Then I am going to use to map method which is available in collections using something called abstract map and simple entities. And then I am going to show you one more using collectors and accumulators. As you can see always, it is a very good practice that you can go to Apache Hadoop.org, download a virtual box and download the Hadoop 3 version along with the Java 8, you can start practicing the today itself. It is very easy, it takes very less time, there is enough documentation available and I will tell you some of the places where you may get stuck. So, let me log into this particular virtual machine and I am logging in as root, it will avoid me uh, uh, getting unnecessary permission issues and uh, <coughs> once you are inside uh, the, the uh, route then you can start a terminal and you can start writing your code. Uh, let it log in. Right and once you go to the terminal and then if suppose I type here Java 
minus version. You use the alternative facility in Unix in order to install Java and make sure that you are having the Java version 1.8. And once you have the Java version, you can do an LS and you have got three code and all this code I will update or I will upload into the JAX Big Data Meetup site at the end of the presentation. And then let us look at three code and I'm going to go to the source directory and let me first show you VI, the word count streams.java. And as you can see on the top, there are some beautiful classes which has been imported. One is the util.concurrent.star and then you can see that there is a class called abstract map which is being used here and then you can see that I'm using some methodology in order to use the Java 8 streams classes and then get the key and value and you will see I'm writing word comma one all of you are familiar with the MapReduce logic where you are getting the words and then those words are getting converted into the key comma one kind of approach and that is not MapReduce, not Hadoop but it is just a very simple Java program. If you are executing this particular code and I have created a script for doing that you will get the output as you can see as uh, hello five times, Java one time, Jax big data two times, world five times. And if suppose you are looking at the next program, which is word count to map.java, right? Word count to map.java. <coughs> it's to map.java, sorry. So, if you look at this particular class, you can see again on the top I have imported util.stream and I'm using one of the fantastic facilities in Java 8, collectors.toMap. Very, very important if there are Java programmers. Collectors class is very, very powerful. And collectors class is from java.util.stream package. Collectors has got a lot of methods available to you in order to help you do your parallelization. So we are using collectors.tumap method in this particular case. And then if you are looking at the last program, which is, I believe, one of the efficient programs that you can think of writing using Java 8, if you look at word count collector.java, and if you look at the last line, you can again see I'm using collectors.tumap grouping by. So look at the number of operations that is being provided by this collectors class. And also you can see for the first time in Java 8, you have got associated maps which are implemented by an abstract map class. And then you can create your simple entries by putting a key and value rather than using, using the difficult hash maps and all those kind of data structures. So that's about Java 8. And once you are coming back, Next, you are going to see that when you are executing your Hadoop 3, first time when you are implementing it, using your Java 8 and downloads from the Apache website, you are going to get errors. And these are the first kind of errors that you are going to see when you start your Hadoop. Why? Earlier, you never faced with this particular problem, which is telling me that you have to be a kind of user in order to start or stop Hadoop. They have made something strict in Hadoop, making sure that only authorized users can start Hadoop and stop Hadoop. So, in your start yarn.sh file, which is starting the yarn, and similarly start dfs.sh file, which is starting your file system, you will have to add some external variables and those variables are already shown in the error messages. So you will have to declare all that export declarations. Otherwise, it will give you this particular error and your Hadoop will not start. Now, some people get very excited, you know, Java 8 is there. Why Java 8? If I go to Oracle, I can download Java 9. So let me download Java 9. Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had tra got trouble at least two, three days while I downloaded Java 9. Why? 
Java 9 has stopped and restricted the greatest technology called reflection. Reflection is the heart of Java. In any object-oriented programming language, dependency injection and that architecture where a class can be injected at runtime in order to avoid or make dynamic programs. And in Google, there are two beautiful libraries. One is called Guava and another is called GUIS, G-U-A-V-A and G-U-I-C-E. These two jar files you can see in almost every open source package because they are very, very important. They are used for dependency injection. And the moment you put Java 9, it will tell you java.lang.noclassfound error. Why? Java 9 is restricting to you for reflection. Is there any way to solve it? Oh, I went there and then somebody intelligent has already put a gyra. And you can see that in the Hadoop site, they are telling that, okay, you bypass that reflection problem by putting a yarn resource manager option, you load everything. And your, your node manager options load everything. That is a way you will tell Hadoop that load everything. If you do these two, then Java 9 will work. Okay, so please wait some time in order to get this streamlined because it is the latest, it is getting into work and once it is stabilized, then you can use Java 9. Until that time, you use Hadoop 3 on Java 8. And if you look at what is Hadoop 3, is the general availability for Hadoop 3 has been released? Answer is no. Hadoop 3, the last release was on October 3. And the current release, which I have installed, is two days back release, Hadoop 3.0 Beta 1. And there is no more beta releases or gamma releases in Hadoop. It is going to be Hadoop general availability. It was expected November 1st week. I was thinking that in November 28, I will announce that GA has been released. But unfortunately, they have not released it. And they are still working it. As usual, there are project delays. <laughs> All right, let us go to next very powerful feature in Hadoop 3. This is completely new to you. In Hadoop 2, you know that the default replication factor for HDFS is 3. You will configure that re default replication factor in your core site.xml. In that, you are going to duplicate the data. Anybody thought about the difficulties in doing it? Anybody thought about the problems associated with it? There are a lot of problems. Okay, once they told, then we understood that there are problems. <laughs> what are those problems? First problem is that whenever you are copying that entire data of a particular block from one data node to another data node, the blocks are getting created into the other data node. And then from there, again, it is creating into the other data node. So entirely, if you avoid the network bandwidth and other issues, you are incurring a 200 percentage overhead. Not only that, if you are incorporating the network and the heartbeats that are happening between name nodes and the data nodes, then there are some additional burden that is happening in the entire Hadoop 2 ecosystem because of this copying. So the pioneers there, they started experimenting, is there a better technology to avoid this and make it better? And that's called erasure coding. Erasure coding, it was invented in 1940s. And they called that particular technology as forward error correction. You can just do a search and go to Wikipedia to get the details of it. What is forward error correction? It is originally used for controlling errors in data transmission. And so many people like the inventor Hamming himself, lot of erasure codes technologies came in. How can I create code? Just like base 64 encoding, etc. We have got so many encoding formats in the similar way. They have created some ways of generating these codes in order to get the data through the communication channels and correct the errors. The Hadoop people found it interesting. And if you look at the theoretical details, it's very easy 
if you think in a mathematical way. So let me draw some diagrams, handwritten diagrams, and to explain you. I have got a foo.txt. That's my input file, hdfs. Huh? And I got two blocks, block 01 and block 02, 128 MB each. HDFS put command, I have, put it, instead of three replication, I'm taking an example of two replications. So, block 01 copied, block 01 copied, so two copies. Ideally three copies, let's take two copies. Block 02, two copies. One simple question, if node 1 and node 2 are gone, can you give me block 1 data? It is not possible. It is not possible to get the block 01 data. And now let us think about the mathematics. In mathematics, if I have two unknowns and if I got two mathematical equations, I can solve two variables. Right? So, if I am putting block 01 and I am to bring block 02, and instead of copying that block 01 as it is, let me do a coding. Read, read Solomon coding, an error correction coding, an erasure coding on that data and store it as if this is A and B, you consider I am storing A plus B. And here I am storing A plus 2B. Now let us take this A and B out. Can I get block 01? Hey, you got A plus B and A plus 2B. Subtract 2B plus A minus A plus B. You got 2B, B. And once you get B, you subtract B from this, you got A. You understand what I mean? By manipulating this particular course, they can reconstruct the data. See how beautiful the approach is. So they used erasure coding for the implementation of replication from Hadoop 3. Do you have the option not to use erasure coding? Yes, you can. I'll tell you how to do that. And if suppose you are looking at the details, old Hadoop 2, how was that replication happening? Very bad, why? The writer was writing to first data node. It was not a parallel write. And once the data is going to the data node 1, from there it was going to the data node 2. And from there it was going to the data node 3. If at any point of time I want to see the data, I have to explicitly run a command H flush or H sync. Otherwise I can't see the data. How can you modify it? Just now I told you Java 8 has got collectors. Java 8 has got parallelism. Java 8 has got concurrency. Java 8 has got very powerful executor service packages in their threading. Let us write a beautiful multi-threading program where I'm not going to write now sequentially. Let us do parallel write. And when you do that parallel write, you have to do that coding. A plus 2B, A plus B, which I told you in the earlier slide. And that Coding, erasure code generation happens at the right time from the client. And then there is acknowledgement being received. In this way, erasure coding make it much easier to retrieve the data. And you know the advantage? Client writes group in dying data nodes at the same time. It is a parallel write. Any of the six, nine replicas, as I mentioned to you, you can retrieve the data. So, if you are looking at the final architecture, block A1, block A2, and if you want to create a copy, I will have this parity-based erasure coding block inside this. And similarly this, similarly this, and then you will be able to retrieve the data. So, if, if you are in Hadoop 3, uh, so if you are coming back to the uh, system here and then you start here and then look at this right so clear the screen and then CD right and then we can just go to Hadoop what is that is it version or minus version it's version right Hadoop version it's 3.00 beta and I have installed it in e slash user slash label and I have called it as Hadoop 3.0 b1 
No change in the directory structure. You have got Lib Libex, Libexec, you have got ETC, and inside the ETC you have got all your configuration files. And one of the most important configuration files, as I, as I mentioned to you earlier, is uh, uh, the, the Hadoop environment.sh as well as the yarn environment.sh. And inside the Hadoop folder, you have got every files that are being stored. No changes at all in the basic architecture and the directory structure. Right? And if suppose you want to start it, you can write start dfs.sh which will be starting it and as you can see that same message is coming there i just used a different name hdfs underscore name node user that's okay but you should declare it i have already declared it in my start dfs.sh otherwise i will get an error as i mentioned to you earlier and then once that start dfs is completed your data node name node secondary name node allowable and you double check it by doing a jbs after that you can go to start uh, uh, start uh, yarn dot as such, which is now starting the the engine part of it. First was the name node and the data node. Again, you will get a similar error. Please don't worry about whether you are using one or the other, but it should be declared. And now, if you are writing JPS, you should be happy. You should have the resource manager, the node manager, the data node, the name node, the secondary name node. Everything should be available to your service. And if suppose you are looking at the HDFS commands, you can just type HDFS. And then if suppose you are looking at all the commands and you will see one very important command that has been added in Hadoop 3, which is summarizing what I just explained to you. So erasure coding CLI is being provided to you. Why? As I mentioned to you, the default is not to use erasure coding. You have to explicitly create an erasure coding zone by looking at the options of that erasure coding. And then in that particular zone, you have to declare the policies. For example, if suppose you write that Hadoop HDFS EZ command and then press enter, you will see all that particular configuration declarations whether you want, you know, what policy you want, what are the properties that you want to declare, etc., etc., it will tell you. Disable the policy, enable the policy, every details will be given to you. That's all about erasure coding. I cannot explicitly show you erasure coding unless we have a cloud environment where multiple replicas are there. This is a virtual machine which has got only one copy. Erasure coding or normal coding does not make any sense. Next, a very simple one, but just to note, it is wherever you had the heap size declaration. Whenever you are writing an external program in Hadoop 2, you have to explicitly give the heap size that is required for your Hadoop program. They have eliminated it. How they have eliminated? Very simple trick. Whenever you run the code, give a XMS option in Java, which is the minimum memory. XMX option, a maximum memory, give a large value, and then you execute your code, it will automatically identify what is the memory size that is required, Mem com completely made it dynamic, okay? And then it will decide what is to be used, mm -hmm. and then it will be executed, right? There is a shell script rewriting, and one of the important things here is that Instead of SSH, they have introduced PDSH. What's the difference, Unix programmers? SSH and PDSH. SSH is single-threaded. PDSH is, PDSH is parallel SSH. So if there are multiple machines, now Hadoop has got the ability to parallelize that particular operation so that it will not go one by one sequentially to all the nodes. That's where PDSH is coming in. Another important thing, the daemon.sh commands are removed and they made it a little bit more readable. HDFS minus daemon start name node rather than calling, you know, daemon.sh file. They can just rewrite this particular thing. And the third, configuration directories, Hadoop environment, etc. are completely available to you in the class bar. Externally, you don't have to load it in old programming style in Hadoop 2 and all. Whenever you write external programs, you will have to manually load that particular file. Now, they are identified as first-class citizens. Again, 
not a big change but just to know it this is good assume that you are writing a hive point two zero program against adobe 2 your program is bound to fail the reason is that the jars that hive point two zero are using are completely different from your hadoop jar files then you will have to synchronize all these files making sure that all versions i had lot of troubles manipulating which file is making a conflict why because somewhere commons language 1.3 is used somewhere commons language 1.2 is used somewhere guava 1.3 is used somewhere protob of 2.4 is used all these were creating lot of troubles when you write external applications dealing with hadoop what they have done is that they removed that particular problem and created server side and client side files separately so that one single client shaded jar file is enough to use whenever you write a program against hadoop irrespective of the versions of hadoop that you are using so just use one particular file and then put it into your class path and then you can add it okay this is called hiding the transitive dependencies that they have done efficiently. Very big next important change. They are bringing the concept of opportunistic containers. What is opportunistic containers? What is a container by the way? We are going to see that in detail when I talk about yarn. You know that Hadoop MapReduce 2 Aka yarn works on the basis of containers. Now, if there is a very complex and difficult task is running and assume that somebody else is coming and giving another very complex task where more containers are needed, the other task will fail because there are no containers available, no enough space for allocating containers. They told, no, we are going to create two separate sections in Node Manager now. What are they? Guaranteed containers and opportunist containers. Guaranteed containers are for those jobs which are very important, which can never fail. Opportunistic containers, if suppose everything is full, all guaranteed containers are packed up, then opportunistic containers will understand that somebody has submitted a job and it will put everything into queues and then it will be slowly slowly releasing but assume that at any point in time a guaranteed container is of high preference and wants to preempt the opportunistic container that is provided opportunistic containers are having less preference and priority than the 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 uh, other other guaranteed containers so that's beautiful where your job can be reliable now it will not immediately fail if there are no containers available it will wait in the queue you only think that only thing is that it will take a little bit of time rather than giving you a failure message there are some latest changes going on this is not complete yet why can't you write J and I, in order to make the things faster. What is J and I? Java native interface. The ability of Java JVM to deal with the underlying operating system at runtime and then call the dynamic libraries and make the things faster. Like C++ code can be invoked from Java. right? And that J and I code, there is some research going on in order to create the map task based on J and I. It is still going on. They are telling that it is fixed, but there are some issues with this particular thing, and there are some work uh, work happening in that space. Next, in Hadoop 2, if one name node is failing, what happened to Hadoop 1? In Hadoop 1, name node, data node, and secondary name node was not a backup name node of name node. If name node is going down, you will have to manually take the FS image journal. From the secondary name node, you have to load it and then you have to restart your name node. In Hadoop 2, what they did? They created a backup for name node. If this is gone, this they are making it alive. In Hadoop 3, they have done, I think somebody has got a lot of time to do some experiments. That's why they made that, oh, now three name nodes. That means two <laughs> can fail. 
<laughs> so that's why, right? And who is the manager of doing all these particular things? What is the secret of managing all these containers effectively? Zookeeper, the best, one of the best open source package that is available in the industry currently, right? Apache Zookeeper, a coordination service. They use the quorum services and in order to identify what has changed, and there is a lot of communication going, in, going, on, going on between this zookeeper nodes and then making sure that the data is getting replicated very fast and so that that active passive state can be reproduced. Oh no, the port have changed completely 570. No more. It will not work at all. So, if suppose you are looking at this particular one, and uh, you go to 570, my Hadoop is running, right? So, so I go here, and then we, we, we go to, oh, what happened? Oops. Cable. Yeah, cable probably. <laughs> <laughs> right, got it. Uh, so, if you look at the, 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 the Hadoop, is the, is the Hadoop running? Yeah, it should be running, right? Right, and then if you go to the browser, right? It's a favorite port, right? Where are the name node details are available? Local, local host, local uh, host, colon 50070, right? Unable to connect. And now you just go here, and instead of 570, you write 9870, and you get your name node details. That's what this means. The ports have changed. You know the reason? The reason is given on the top. If you look at the details, they call it as ephemeral ports for Linux. Linux uses these ports internally, and your 50,700 and all those kind of ports are coming in this particular range, which was conflicting with some of the operations in Linux in large level clusters. They wanted to remove that and they changed everything into this particular one. Most important is 9870. 8088, no change at all. What's 8088? The yarn UI. Some file system connectors, they are supporting Azure Data Lake as well as Aliun. What is Aliun? Alibaba's storage system and uh, they are now supporting Aliyun storage as well in Hadoop 3. Just like they can work on S3, uh, sorry, C3, you can work on all these two. They are extending the support for Amazon connector. Even though it is written as S3 guard, you pronounce it as C guard. So C guard is the pronunciation. They are creating some connectors for Amazon S3 as well. So there are some file system connectors being built. Next one. What happens in a data node? What is a data node basically? A data node can contain one disk or many disks. A data node can contain many disks because disks are external storage attached with your data node. It can be 10 disks, 20 disks, 30 nibs, and they use RAID, redundant array of inexpensible disks or JBODs whenever they are implementing this Hadoop cluster. What happens if suppose there is some data and you put the data, the data will be distributed. And you can see an identical size of the data in all your data nodes. What happens inside the data node, in between the disks? This data will get distributed, right? Blocks, all the blocks will be distributed. What happens if you replace this disk or you add more? Task tracker, ah, Hadoop 1. Hadoop 1 has got task tracker and job tracker, right? No resource manager, no, no node manager, no that business. That business came later. So task tracker and you have got data node. And task trackers are for execution of your code. Data nodes, as usual, are, 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 are for storing the data. Yes, you got the data and now the Hadoop client is coming in and the Hadoop client is submitting a job. And the moment you submit the job, the job is getting deployed into the task trackers. And once it is deployed, then there is this particular map reduce happening in between the task trackers, map processes, after that shuffle and sort, and after shuffle and sort, it will go to the reducer, and then finally the output is given. That is Hadoop 1. 
What was the problem in that architecture? Job tracker was the problem. Why? Job tracker was managing the task trackers. Job tracker was looking at the resources. Job tracker was checking whether the nodes are alive or not. Job tracker was managing with the name node and talking with the name node whether any node is dying and how to do a speculative execution by rerunning the map reduce. Everything this poor job tracker was doing and somebody felt pity at that job tracker and created, hey job tracker, I'm giving you two more resources under you. One is the resource manager and another is the node manager and so many other internal services. Application master, containers, everything. And then there is a scheduler. And Hadoop 2 evolved. Yarn. Right? And in Hadoop 2, what did they do? They created that resource manager. And look at how the client is getting involved. The client is submitting a job. And yes, submit the app. It will go to application master. Application master is getting created per application. One application master per application. Application master will decide not job tracker. Application master will decide out of these nodes, hey, who are capable of running this, right? So it will decide, yeah, this machine is generated container one, container two, container three. Ah, good. And now the map reduce will work. And let us now see what happens if there is another one coming in now. Another client, right? Then another client, I am too. Oh, this container, very good. This is container, very good. And this is also another container. And look, this machine is very powerful. It can run two containers at the same time. Who decided? Application master decided. That is what YARN is all about. YARN divides the work between resource manager, application master, containers, etc. And you get that particular output, right? And... We have introduced already the queues. So, everybody will say, Hadoop 1, the only type of program that you can write was MapReduce. And they said a completely different word now. What is that they are using? Data operating system. Yarn is a data operating system. You have to get this concept very clear. It is not a simple slide and this is what is going to control the entire Hadoop 3 and Hadoop 4, 5, 6, 10, whatever that is. Everything, the future of Hadoop is based on YARN. This is the most powerful, innovative architecture that they have brought in. So let's understand YARN in detail. What's the difference between this and this? Why do they call YARN as an operating system? To understand that, you have to know, basically take an analogy, what is the difference between when you are running a Microsoft Word application in your laptop and assume that I am giving you a laptop and you are running Microsoft Word, PowerPoint and let us say Excel. What's the difference? If you run Microsoft Word, you can do only within the constraints of Microsoft Word. You can do what Microsoft Word is providing you, supported to you. But when you are having Word, Excel and PowerPoint, it is your flexibility. You can create a similar application of your own because the operating system is allowing you to create an application on the top of it as opposed to using only Microsoft Word alone. If you use Microsoft Word alone, that's Hadoop 1. If you use Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all these kind of things, that's Yarn. Because you are getting an operating system, and here there is no operating system, only one approach, that's it, MapReduce. And I'm going to explain to you, and how I'm going to explain to you, let's write a MapReduce program, right? And if you're running the MapReduce program, let us write the traditional MapReduce program, and from there we will start it, right? So, if suppose you are looking at, I think there is a connection. <coughs> Yeah, and let's start it, right? So let's start it, okay? And 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 and, and, and clear the screen, right? Alas, and make sure that all your processes are running, and uh, uh, and, and 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 let's go to uh, clear the screen, right? 
And what we are going to do, Hadoop FS, okay, let me check whether any file is there or not. Hadoop FS slash, right, Hadoop, sorry, Hadoop FS minus LS slash, right, LS slash. And then let's check whether any file is there or not. There should be something which I have tried, yeah. Sample, so if suppose I look at slash sample, I think there should be some file, right. Uh, uh, Sample.txt is there. So if I do a Hadoop FS minus cat and then slash sample, slash sample dot txt i should be getting this particular file right all right hello world world hello 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 world world okay so many things are there inside that so what we are going to do is that we are going to have our next word count and how will you run the word count let us run the word count program hey, you will be writing adop right jar and then you have to have the map reduce examples jar file which contains your word count program where is that file available Inside the user, I told you already that my Hadoop is installed inside then and always go to the share directory and always go to the MapReduce directory inside the share folder, I think share Hadoop MapReduce folder. Inside the MapReduce folder, there will be a Hadoop MapReduce examples.jar file that is available, right? And in that word count, there is a word count program given to you, right? And that word count program is not going, uh, now going to take the sample as the input file. And let me call this one as, okay, out uh, one as the output file. You may have noticed that already I created a slash out when I tried this. So out one is the output directory. And if everything is okay, now your first MapReduce program on Hadoop 3 should work without any problems if everything is correct and it should kickstart the map and reduce processes, right? Uh, Right, so the map and reduce processes are started and it will be going incrementally. First the map and then goes to the shuffle and sort which will not be given to you. And no output are given to you and then finally the reduce operation. And then you will get all the details about all your counters. And if suppose you go to the Hadoop FS minus cat now and sample slash, not sample, out one slash, out one slash part star. And if suppose you are looking at the output, you should be getting uh, the, the output desired for you, correct? So the map reduce is working and now what is interesting is that let us go to the yarn UI and I am going to go to localhost any change in the port? No, 8088 is not changed and inside that you got your map reduce program available here just now we executed that and please look at this application type I want you to concentrate on that. MapReduce, because I just wrote a MapReduce program. Word count is a world famous MapReduce. Your doctorate this. Huh? <laughs> so you got MapReduce. Now I'm going to show you something else. Can you write a simple Hello World program onto Yarn? <clears throat> no MapReduce. What is this? How can you write a simple program on Yarn, right? So let's try. I'm going to use a framework. And what framework we are going to use? We are going to use any of the framework you can use, but I'm going to use one of the very, very powerful one. It's called Twill. And there is Spring Yarn. And there is a third one, also available, Slider. Watch these through, three. Apache Slider, Spring, and Twill. And I'm going to use Twill. And I have got the tool installed here. And I got the tool examples installed here. Oh, sorry. And I have got my yarn here. And I'm going to go to CA, source, ORG, source, source. Right. CD main, and then Java. It's a Maven project, as you know. Uh, ORG, and Apache, and then tool. LS, CD, example. Alas, and CDR. Ah, vi hello world.java. And let us write a message. Just in a runnable class. Hello, Yarn from Jack's Big Data, our first Yarn Eyes redistributed application. That's the message. <laughs> I'm going to Yarn Eyes my application. No map reduce, no mapper, no reducer. Don't look at that code at all. Okay, after yarnizing that application, what I'm going to do? Use any of these frameworks and then come back. Uh, 
CDP. Tell us. Uh, I have got the execute text. I'm going to copy that. As you can see, I am running the Hello World program now. Okay? And please look. Localhost 2181. What is this localhost 2181? If you are familiar. And if you are using YARN. If you are YARNizing your application. There are different technologies that these people use. One is... Whenever you submit your application to the application manager, application manager will put the request into a Kafka queue. And the containers are going to take that from the Kafka messaging queue. And then it will coordinate and will give you the result. A beautiful architecture. Very highly scalable. Real time. One trillion messages at Twitter. Early grade. Kafka. And Twill uses Kafka. And for Kafka, you need Zookeeper. And for Zookeeper, you need port 2181. <laughs> so, I'm going to go to another command prompt. CD slash user slash lib slash uh, uh, Zookeeper. Huh? And bin slash zk server dot sh. Start. And after starting, we go back to this tool. I copy that pi execute dot text, and now the local host two one eight one is running. Control C. Uh, sorry. Control C doesn't work. This is not Windows. Ooh. Right. And then I am going to paste that. And uh, to, to, to show you the clear output, I am going to redirect the output into a file called uh, Hadoop uh, 3.txt. Okay. Hadoop 3.txt. Let's run. Till. Yanizing trick. Nothing is coming in the output except the logs. Reason is I redirected the output. And once the things are complete, you should get a prompt back. Which shows that the program is over. We started Zookeeper. We started Yarn. Yeah, everything is okay. Will this program work if I close my start dfs.sh? Yes, it will work. It doesn't depend on start dfs at all. Right? And if you look at VI Hadoop 3.txt and Now I produce. We wrote an application, and now most interesting thing is that let us go back to the yarn UI, right? It will hit it. Ah, that was my produce, and this is yarn. Now you wrote a yarn application. This is the concept of yarn. Yarn is not only we are not only allowing you map produce, you can write anything on yarn. Now tell me, if somebody came from Berkeley University and telling that I got an in-memory map produce, I am going to yarnize my map produce program, what do you get? Spark. <laughs> <laughs> they got the concept, right? That's what Spark is all about. So today you have got an ab initio job which is taking a lot of time. Write us a Java program, yarnize it. And what is the advantage if you yarnize it? Containers, dynamic. Never fails, no problems at all. Containers will be allocated. You got guaranteed containers, up to opportunities containers. You got an extensible architecture. You got beautiful ways of scalability for your platforms. If they are telling you and knocking your door, telling that $2 million, $3 million, $8 core license, $20 core license, no. I will put commodity machines, Yana is my application. From my opinion, show, I will just do a trigger to my Java program. That's it. That is the concept of YARN. Now you got it. What is meant by YARN as a data operating system? And that's what we say as YARN is a data operating system. And the whole of the Hadoop, you can switch it off. Oh, 10 more minutes only. Okay, let, let me complete this, this language. Okay. So that's what they mean by YARN operating system, right? And, uh, and uh, if you are looking at the latest things that is going to come in Hadoop, 3 plus and beyond. 
they are integrating whatever is possible and they are creating own private private cloud public cloud everything etc right and uh, uh, very quickly what is meant by history server history server will tell you the details about your map reduce application okay very good but just now you learned that i can write non map reduce applications on my yarn right so who is going to give me the details about those applications fail because it was meant for only map reduce so that all hey i am going to write a new kind of application which i am going to call as application timeline server version 1 in hadoop 2 and they created a separate process and that separate process is called a timeline server the timeline server will watch all of your map reduce and yarn applications and it will watch all of your statistics metrics code container details everything it will write all your data using a single thread it will collect all your data using logging you see something very bad here right ah so what we need yarn timeline server version 2 all the bottlenecks that i have mentioned is eliminated and they created a very flexible data model today if you look at uh, uh, youtube videos you will see that create an extensible metric platform based upon yarn ats v2 people started creating products just by using this architecture why this much detail is more than enough to give you any statistics about your application it beats splunk i am very bold here to tell that splunk is a log aggregation tool very famous very widely used by the proper use of flume agents map reduce and this architecture you can easily get that particular information there were only three classes a timeline domain class timeline entity class and timeline event class in ats v1 and you look at the new model data model and uh, let me scare you with a diagram as well and that is a diagram that is happening in ats v2 application master they have got output collectors output collectors is writing the data and it is getting the data back it is collecting all the information they made it is multi threaded all that problems of ats v1 has been eliminated in ats v2 which they call as timeline server version 2 right and uh, uh i will skip these slides these are all not very important points but this you cannot eliminate support for linux container executor is one of the major advantage in yarn just now we have learned that it has got the container services and application manager is starting the containers what's container what is microservices docker what is the difference between a virtual machine and a docker virtual machine is having independent entities when i run three virtual machines it is three independent entities right but docker is sharing across the entire 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 platform so the support for linux container is there so can you tell me now if there is a linux container executor support and support for doc this is how you will configure it even map reduce and spark you can configure you can see that docker comma yarn container runtime docker equal to hadoop docker so i am using a hadoop docker image docker image is available on hadoop now and once you are using it on the top of the yarn what will happen all the docker containers will start executing and entire program will be getting executed on the top of the docker containers and once you have docker container on the top of yarn you can write another yarn application on the docker container yarn on yarn <laughs> so if there is yarn on yarn what is it called why cloud <laughs> why cloud why cloud <laughs> not normal cloud it is why cloud it is yarn on yarn yarn on the top of yarn you have docker and on the top of the docker you have got yarn again and then on the yarn you test your map reduce oh map reduce is getting tested oh, sorry hadoop is getting tested by yarn what an in what a what an immense thing right <coughs> that's hadoop 
Uh, I don't know how many ta- how much time I have. <laughs> Five minutes. Uh, I, 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 I don't know how far I can go, but a very quick overview. You guys want to give him 10 minutes? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 15 okay. minutes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh-huh. Go. It's okay, right? Uh, so there, there is this hado. And after this hado, everybody has come up. Oh, I, I built this on the top of it. I built that on the top of the hado. I built this on the top of the hado. There are so many tools came in, right? So, the old big data is like this. This was hado, this was my how to, this was this particular thing, this was this thing, this was that thing, this was this thing. completely distributed hey i want everything in a beautiful nice house everything single together i don't want to go anywhere i want a new way of representing mm. things that is new big data everything combined together am i live machine learning graphics graph processing spark in memory compute right the most important thing is you have to get the concept right and this slide is showing you the concept because many have asked me what is the difference and what you do in spark the only one type of approach that is possible in the map reduce world is map and reduce map reduce map reduce map reduce map reduce this and this cannot happen parallel unless you do it explicitly i can write map reduce reduce no i cannot write map 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 reduce no every input should come from hdfs every output will go to hdfs period change map reduce store the output in the memory and from there again give to another reduce and then find out is there anything which is having a dependency on this then execute them in parallel staging dag direct acyclic graph that spark in spark there are different stages that can happen and they execute using the different stages this is the fundamental idea of spark and what i want to discuss with you it is very clear and it is there in the slides very well i will go to the last slide which is showing you not last the last but one slide which is showing you uh, one very important feature of spark which is which is the the, the summary slide of all the things that i wanted to tell spark 2.x is giving high emphasis on data frames and data sets you work with rddis rosalie and distributed data sets that was spark earlier versions the only high level abstraction that was available to you was rdd even though they introduced this data frames from 1.6 they are making it more popular they are making it more better and that is where they have brought in data frames and data sets what's the difference if you want to read a data frame and you want to manipulate it use sql kind of expressions a data frame is like a relational table they are trying their best to make it inter- interoperable with r data frames so that in spark r you can directly call a data frame and start manipulating it whereas a data set is a high level abstraction which can deal with unstructured and structured well which can infer schema and which has got almost all the facility facilities like rdd but much faster and better why it is faster let me illustrate you with another example so i'm just switching my machine uh, just to show you that example because that's also a very important example and uh, please don't mind i'm not using spark for showing you that why because i'm using a similar concept which is there exactly like spark because this one is giving you a more better picture than spark i want you to understand what is happening that's why i'm using this architecture so i'm going to here and then let us do one thing i'm starting the terminal right uh uh terminal right and uh, in the terminal let me start all my hadoop here this is a different machine and it is hadoop 2 it is not hadoop 3 why it is hadoop 2 because i am going to run a spark kind of tool spark is little bit slow they have not yet ready 
or released the version for Hadoop for Euler wait. So the name not data node, you see that Hadoop user and all those errors are not coming now. Why? Because it is Hadoop 2. In Hadoop 3, that errors, that messages will come, which user is starting the processes as I have already mentioned to you, right? And uh, we will start all the processes and I'm going to start Kafka as well. Uh, if, if time permits, I'll just show you an example of that as well. Uh, that is Kafka. Uh, so, so let it start. Uh, yeah, the zookeeper is started. I, I combined basically all the scripts that is needed. The start all the research and everything and then Kafka is started and everything is started, right? And then I'm going to go to a master folder and then I'm going to go to a server folder and then I'm going to start this particular application by writing bin launcher run. Please imagine that this is very, very, very similar like Spark, but not exactly like Spark, but I wanted to explain to you what is meant by stages. That's why I'm taking this application, right? And... Uh, uh, if you want to know, it is my own application and this is what I do for my company and this particular product is called Uniconnect which internally has used DAG as I click execution and that's what I wanted to show you. So CD master and then clear the screen, right? And after that, I'm going to run a particular query and uh, you know that whenever you are running a query, you can reuse a command line interface like Scala and we also have got our own command line interface and I'm going to start that uh, uh, command line interface here uh, by typing my client jar file, okay? Uh, LS, uh, yeah. Uh, so I am starting my client jar file. As you can see, it is starting the client interface and let me just show you a particular query which is joining the data between Hive and MySQL. So when you execute this particular query, you are getting some results. All right, you got some results. And when you got some results, it is good time to see how the DAG is getting executed. I'm opening the screen and then I'm going to the port which is showing you like 4040 is a port we have created. Our own port here, use 8080. And I'm going to look at the finished query. And as you can see, I have executed a query and I'm going to look at the live plan of this particular query. This is how the DAG will look like. And this is what exactly Spark has done. And please look at the beauty here. And this is what is done in Spark 2. You will not see this filter in the earlier versions of Spark. Why? Spark does not do query optimization. Spark did not use Catalyst Optimizer, which is a very important innovation in Spark 2.x. Without the query optimization, what happened is, without the filter condition, what is the filter condition? The where clause, the predicate. Without the where clause, the entire data travels through the network and goes to the other stage. And then shuffling, partitioning, and joining happens. So, if you are querying one terabyte of data, gone through the network, one terabyte has to travel. What Spark has done in 2.x is, they implemented data sets, and they implemented the queries based upon tungsten and query optimizer. What does that mean? If there is a where clause, rather than fetching all that one terabyte, it will fetch only what is required after applying a filter. The filter is pushed down. That's what DAG is all about. And you can get more details. And in Spark also you can get more details and I will show you with my tool how the details can be there. And uh, that particular query that you have just executed, go to the beginning of the query and do an explained plan. And when you are doing an explained plan, it is going to show you that explained plan very detailed. And if you look at the plan, scan filter. The filter applied. And after filtering the applied, then the remote exchange of the data happens. This is how you will debug Spark. By explain plan. This remote exchange in the earlier versions happened without applying the filter. So the remote exchange data is very, very big. Right? So that's one of the parts in Spark 2.2. And I will come back two minutes more. So, if you are looking at data engineering, if you have got a platform, 
You want to incorporate Hadoop 3. You want to incorporate Spark 2.x. How best you can incorporate all these things. What is the secret of that particular architecture? Very simple. Build a wall. <laughs> ah, so the people are laughing. Now build a wall in Spark. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. So how will you build the wall? You can paper it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very easy. <laughs> Why it's not coming? Oh, I thought I'm sure. I call it as AUP platform, an a priori unification platform. And let me explain you this, just, just last slide. You have got all your databases, right? And you know very well that because of the polyglot persistence and because of the latest features that are coming in, you may need a MongoDB, you may need a Cassandra, you may need a, a, a level DB, you may need a, uh, JSON documents, you need file stores, you need HDFS, you have unstructured structure, and you need real-time data through Kafka. Keep it. Polyglot persistence layer, the P. And what do you do? And what the entire world is doing? There is no middle tier from R or Spa or Zeppelin or Anaconda or Python. What did you do? You directly call this. No, that's not good. Why that is not good? What did you do some years back in the web applications? When you created a JSP or HTML, you combined presentation, you combined business logic, you combined database access, everything you cluttered together and they told that no, this is not good. MVC, Model View Controller Architecture is the best. This separated model, view and controller. Why can't we do the same thing in the analytical platforms? I am going to separate it. This is my business layer. Here I will put YAM and I will YAMize my applications. And I am going to have virtualization. I will put Docker containers. I will put the tool that we, I was showing you, Uniconnect. There happens all the unification from all these data sources. This guy should not know about that. And they should not know, ideally. And once you get this, this is the wall. From there, you access what is relevant for your analytics. Otherwise, you are misusing big data architecture. If you call the data directly from your Spark program, you know what is the problem? Spark relies on RDD. And your terabytes of data, it will store into the RDD. How much space it is leaving for you to run your analytical algorithms then? How are you going to run your DNA sequencing algorithm, k-means, clustering, all these kind of things? Because already the RDDs are occupying the entire data. Where are you going to create your models? That's not good. Get what is required. Create an independent layer here. Lay layer here. And then through that layer, you access the other data sources. So wherever you go, and this has proven successful, many places we have done it. It is giving you transparency, and this can be used for exploratory analytics or operational analytics. Those two are different. Operational analytics are Vika, all these tools. Exploratory analytics, Spark. But Spark is making a bridge between exploratory analytics and uh, operational analytics. Exploratory analytics can be done here. I'm not saying that don't create a spark connection here. That is possible. But your end results, your algorithms, your model creations, your machine learning fundamentals, all the scalability things, everything should happen here. And also, one more lesson. Make sure your architecture is passing PPC benchmarking. What is PPC benchmarking? Those who are all familiar with the testing, please go to www.ppc, Taiwan, Poland, uh, credit. China. Yeah, China. Mm -hmm. TPC. www.tpc.org. And make sure there are 23 queries that are being provided by this benchmarking. That 23 queries are working on one terabyte of data. 
on various data sizes. And uh, uh, if you want to see how it is working on, uh, this, this, is, this is a sample query. And the line item table is one terabyte. Out of one terabyte, uh, 700 GB is for this particular thing. Like this, there are 23 queries given by TPC. Make sure that your Spark architecture or your, or your big data architecture is passing the 23 queries within reliable time. Those are the two takeaways. Right? So, always remember to build the wall. <laughs> that will help you to eliminate your front-end problems and then create an extensible architecture. So, wish you all that is good for you. And uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. <laughs> and thanks a lot for giving this great opportunity. Without ah, uh, ooh, and all, we have completed it successfully. So thank God as well. Uh, and uh, we'll see you with uh, Docker and Kubernetes at a later point of time, how the container-based execution can be done. Uh, maybe after a couple of months, right? Uh, whenever she calls, right? Uh, right? And uh, thanks a lot for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Do we have any questions?